Welcome to the Business of College Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Dosh, the Sports Biz Miss. And today with me, I have Chris Giles. He is the co founder and the CEO of Fan Rally, a really innovative app for ticketing that, quite frankly, blew my mind. I- I think it's a no-brainer. I don't know why every school isn't using this, but if you haven't heard about it and your school's not using it, I encourage you to check out this episode and hear about all of the opportunities this gives not only your fans, but your athletic department to be more efficient, to fill more seats, to generate more revenue. I really was impressed by everything this app can do, and I think a lot of these features are especially going to resonate with your younger fans and give you opportunities opportunities to reach that younger demographic. And I'm just blown away by all the different ways that you can use Fan Rally to up your game when it comes to ticketing. So without further ado, I give you my interview with Chris Giles. This is the Business of College Sports podcast with your host, the founder of businessofcollegesports.com, Christy Dosh. Find her on Twitter and Instagram at sportsbizmiss. Chris, welcome to the Business of College Sports podcast. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Christy. Pleasure to be here. I was telling you before we got started, the audience is going to be really excited that I'm doing something non-NIL because we've been on NIL overload for the better part of the last year. So now let's talk about ticketing because I feel like this is a topic I haven't visited in a while and I'm really excited to have you share about your company, Fan Rally. But I'd love for you to tell folks first what you did before Fan Rally and how your career brought you to this place. Absolutely. So I actually started uh, my career after undergrad uh, completely outside of sports. I was a consumer and retail investment banking analyst. I did that for a number of years and candidly just got to a point where, uh, one, I was sleeping under my desk too often. uh, And (laughs) two, I was working on subject matters that weren't really that appealing to me. I I did a makeup company IPO and it just got to this place where I was like, I just want to work on things that I love. Uh, And so I went to business school in 2008 at uh, UC Berkeley uh, and had a chance encounter with a guest speaker uh, in my sports marketing class. I took a class taught by Sandy Alderson, who's now uh, the president of baseball ops for the Mets. Um, And he's got lots of connections to Cal. And he had Larry Scott as a guest speaker in the class, who at the time was uh, the CEO of the WTA. Yeah, so, so I, I was his intern at the WTA. <laughs> so in a like Kevin Bacon small world sort of thing, I, I was a corporate attorney and did securities before I went into sports. And then when you said Larry's name, I was thinking, oh my gosh, I, I, when I was in law school at University of Florida, I spent a summer at the WTA tour under Larry. So there you go. <laughs> um, I also sent a, spent a summer at the WTA tour under Larry working on uh, what would ultimately be Pac-10 stuff. Um, so I, I, I was there, I think, before that. When I was there, he did not have his eye on college athletics. I worked with him on a new agent code for the WTA tour because they had never had any sort of agent certification process. And, you know, a lot of the girls were represented by parents and uncles and whatever. Mm-hmm. And we were trying to rein in some bad behavior, I think, that was happening. And so it wasn't even on his radar. It wasn't until years later, after I had practiced law and was working at ESPN, that he ended up uh over on the west coast and i was so excited because he had been a great boss and so visionary at the wta i was really excited to see him come into all college athletics so that's so interesting that he's somebody who you encountered and who sort of inspired you along the way because i thought he was great too uh he's uh one of the most uh insightful leaders i've ever worked for he's uh he's been an inspiration to me and he gave me my very first opportunity to work in sports so he um, about two weeks after he was the guest speaker in our class, you know, I did the kind of, you know, standard student thing at the end where I, you know, lined up with all the other students to just, you know, try to get a word in and see if I could, you know, make an impact. And one thing led to another, and the professor at the time actually set up um, an opportunity for us to present to him. He ended up hiring me and a group of Cal students. 
as an intern group. He had been named commissioner, but hadn't started yet. So I flew out to Florida. We did, you know, a couple of weeks with him in Florida, and ultimately he moved uh, to California um, and started as the commissioner. And we tried to create the Pac-16, if you remember, like the original <laughs> expansion push. Um, we've got some really cool stories of just being chased by the media through Lubbock, Texas, and all sorts of things <laughs> that was going on. And I was reporting on all that at the time. By then, yeah. I was at ESPN, and I was reporting on conference expansion. <laughs> Yes. I mean, we had a guy on top of the press box in Lubbock drop a microphone down. Like, there's all sorts of crazy things going on. Um, but long story short, we ended up creating the Pac-12. We added Colorado and Utah. Um, and that op ultimately opened us up for a football championship game. Uh, Larry gave me my first real leadership opportunity at that point, said you can run the football championship game. Um, and so I got to know Jed York and Parag Marate at the Niners through that process. Um, they were looking for, a, you know, for content for the new building that they were building uh, mm -hmm. that is now Levi Stadium. And we were looking for a place to move away from the uh, home hosted model. We started, you know, having the game at the highest seed and planning a game where you don't know where the game is going to take place. Yeah. That would be the most miserable endeavor on the planet. Um, <laughs> and so we, we ended up um, building uh, a football championship game, uh, hosting it at Levi Stadium, and uh, through that process, uh, Parag made me an offer to go run strategy for the 49ers. So I left college sports at that point, uh, went and helped build uh, Levi Stadium, uh, ultimately you know, worked a lot on programming the events that were in there, got to go back to my college days and do deals to bring college football games to the stadium. Um, and long story short, uh, I did that for uh, a number of years and then got an opportunity to be the COO of the Oakland A's. Uh, and so I uh, was the COO of the A's from 2017 to 2020. Uh, and during that process, we really started to tinker with new, what I will call fan models. So we've used this same approach of selling these resellable bundles of tickets in quantities that are way too big for consumers uh, for about 150 years. The Chicago White Stockings in the 1870s invented the season ticket. Um, oh. And we figured out at the A's that we were selling almost all of these to people that were older than 35. And we had this massive void of young people that weren't forming direct relationships with teams. They were buying literally all of the resold inventory that we were selling the 55-year-old they wanted to go to 30 games. They would list the other 50. That's what the modern consumer was buying. They were developing relationships with resale marketplaces instead of with teams directly. And in the, wow. you know, today's day and age where having information about your customers and understanding their preference is essential to delivering them a competitive experience that feels like a lot of these tech-enabled services that they use in their everyday lives was really what was missing. And so we built a program called A's Access, which basically gave subscription access to seat reservations to uh, our fans at that point. Uh, we had three outcomes of that process, really. So one, we were able to sell about 10,000 new memberships. So we got this very clear feedback from the consumer that we want this kind of new form of flexibility. Two, it ended up being you know terribly complicated and uh, intensive to operate. We didn't have any software. So if you wanted something, you had to talk to a service rep. Um, and then ultimately we were issuing resellable tickets. And so what we ultimately ended up doing is realizing that these tickets were being claimed and then resold. We ended up, you know, really hurting our ability to sell single game tickets. I think our single game ticket revenue was down by almost as much as wow. uh, we had grown our membership base. And that was really the insight to me. You have this entire industry in travel that allows, you know, consumers to book inventory, but to, to do it on a reservation basis. In other words, I can't book a hotel and then sell it to, you know, on some third party marketplace and the hotel is trying to figure out who's coming. Like, <laughs> better so in essence, what we do at Fan Rally is we enable teams to sell memberships that are based on direct seat reservations that don't have a ticket tied to them at all. Okay. 
Do you remember, I'm curious, as you were sort of explaining how this got started, do you remember that first subscription that you sold with the A's, what people were paying for that, just out of curiosity? So it wasn't a set price because we had the memberships available in lots of different seating locations. So okay. you know, it was really inexpensive for the least desirable or standing room only type of seat locations. Um, but then it got, you know, considerably more expensive if you wanted the ability to, you know, have your reserve seats in a more premium location. Okay, that makes sense. All right, so explain to us how you go from these lessons you learned with the A's to now this fabulous app you have, Fan Rally. Yeah, so Fan Rally is basically a tool that we uh, we partner with teams directly and we license them our software for them to create their own direct reservation membership. So I'll give you an example. Um, one of the highest volume partners on the platform we have today is the University of South Carolina. The okay. University of South Carolina uses our software to sell two different products. Uh, the first of which is what they call the Go Pass. And so you basically pay a monthly subscription fee for the ability to go to any event that you want. And this used to be challenging to deliver because in order to give you access to an event, they actually had to give you a ticket. And there's only so many tickets that are available and you had this really challenging, you know, low utilization rate of those tickets. Mm -hmm. And so now we do this all on privileges. So you actually subscribe to the privilege to make seat reservations as opposed to purchasing tickets. And okay. so it allows the team to remain, you know, to maintain control of inventory and deliver, you know, group experiences when they need to. Um, but ultimately it allows that consumer flexible access to the events that they want to go to. And then we've eliminated all of the traditional ticketing based seat block constraints. So when you buy four seats, you have to go with the group of four every time. If you have six people that want to go, you're kind of SOL. You can't really do right. anything with those seats. Whereas when you subscribe to reservation privileges, if you had four fan rally memberships for the University of South Carolina and you wanted to go to a football game, but you had two other people with you, you would simply go on to our reservation software. You would reserve the four seats plus two extra. We would know that there were two extra seats up there and we would give you a member discount to book those two additional seats, but it would be all within one contiguous seat block. And I, I'm imagining that this isn't just football, that this applies to other sports there as well? Yeah, it actually applies to every sport on campus. Um, okay. so we do have a football-specific pass for the University of South Carolina if you just want to go to football. Uh, but mm -hmm. their no pass is actually um, good for every single sporting event on campus. And one of the things we're finding um, is we're really finding a cool niche with Stanford, another one of our partners, around using this uh, for women's sports. So they run a W pass on our platform, which for your monthly fee, you can book seats to every single women's sporting event on campus. So okay. it allows them to kind of combine forces uh, and create some real direct monetization models for their women's sports program. At, with football, because obviously some schools have very high demand for season tickets for football, where does this come in? Do they release season tickets first and then this is inventory left after that? Or how does this play alongside season tickets? Yeah, we ultimately believe that direct reservations will completely replace season tickets over the next five to 10 years. Um, the way that it would work in a reservation context is you would start with a set of pre-made reservations. We know very clearly that that traditional 35 to 55 year old audience wants that seat location. And so we would start them with a set of pre-made seat locations, but as organic demand for seasons continues to decline, teams have been uh, having to uh, deliver more and more exchange privileges. So you can't go to this game, so we'll exchange them for this game. And that's created uh, a pretty big load on their service team. So we're mm -hmm. automating a lot of that member flexibility so you can start with your set of seats. The teams can actually program how the exchanges work in our system so that the member can actually say, hey, I can't go to this Saturday's home game, but I'd actually like to get four seats instead of two for next Saturday's home game. So we can facilitate all of those transactions via our platform so that one, it's really easy for the consumer to make those changes. And two, 
it doesn't require you know a, a human to actually go into the ticketing system and make those changes like yeah. the store. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I was also thinking, you know, a lot of schools for football in particular have some sort of priority arrangement. They have levels. A lot of them use a point system based on how much you've donated and how long you've been in the system and that sort of thing. Is that something you can carry over into this so that you're taking care of your higher higher priority fans? That's exact. We actually think we do a better job on this front than you can with tickets. So if you think about issuing that you know, most important donor uh, season ticket. What you're really doing is saying, here's access to our highest level club experience. Go and sell that or give it away to anybody you want. Whereas our model is different. It is unique to the specific members. So you can actually create club spaces that are just for your highest level donors and their guests. And so you're basically, you know, you're adding this element of exclusivity to the experiences that you're able to deliver because not every experience has to be completely transferable on the ticket. You can actually allow a member to book a direct reservation, very much like a country club would allow a member a member to book a tea time. Mm -hmm. What about, so as this replaces season tickets, which makes a lot of sense to me, does that really cut out third-party brokers like do, would they have any access to the system or to excess tickets how would that work yeah resale is currently extracting about eight and a half billion dollars of consumer spending out of our ecosystem so if you look at just uh, 2019 is the last kind of real good data we have given everything that's gone on um, yeah. but you've got about 26 billion dollars of consumer spending uh, on sports tickets and eight and a half billion of that is going to these unaffiliated third parties that are one, either buying the tickets directly from the team and charging a markup and reselling them, or the marketplaces charge transaction fees to connect buyers and sellers. So our model is you know, not too dissimilar from other content meetings. You see all of these content owners going direct to consumer distribution models. We're empowering teams and athletic departments to do the same thing. You don't have to issue a ticket to allow consumers access to your seats. You can use a different model. So if I have a subscription and, you know, generally speaking, I go to the games, I'm not necessarily saying I, I want to give back my two for this game because I want four for the next game. But, you know, let's say there is a game that I'm giving up, but I want my, you know, I've got friends that I want to go. Is that a real easy transfer to just be able to let friends or family or other folks have my tickets for that game? Yeah, we don't. Uh, so this is a, a nomenclature thing, but we don't have tickets on our platform, but we allow members, yeah, to transfer <laughs> seats to other people. So we don't allow resale. So you cannot take a, uh, a seat out of the fan rally ecosystem uh, to sell it on name a given marketplace. Um, right. But we do enable sharing of seats across the entire platform. And this actually helps okay. teams and athletic departments build a much more powerful data model. Because the challenge with the current ecosystem is, as an athletic department, I know who the donor is, who owns those four seats. I don't know anything really that happens after that. Whereas yeah. Fan Rally is different in two uh, ways. One, we capture the actual user level data instead of the account level data. And two, whatever you do with the seat all stays within a closed ecosystem so we can tell the athletic department exactly who the user is as opposed to just capturing buyer data. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely had situations. I remember when I was a student, I, I was in law school at UF and it was when Urban Meyer and Tim Tebow were there. So it was good Gator years. Yep. It was hard to get tickets, but there was a donor that I knew through a friend and he really only went to a couple of games a season. And my friend was in law school with me there. And so he gave us his tickets most of the time. And so, you know, UF had no idea that he rarely went to games and that really it was me and my friend there most of the time. They didn't even know we existed or what our names were. <laughs> yeah, and this this is a classic example of why we believe there's a better model. I mean, it's think about how different the ecosystem was in the 1870s when this product was created. There was no resale, there was no e-tickets, there was none of this stuff. And we're still using this same model. And so we believe that 
empowering teams to allow you know consumers to make direct reservations is a fundamentally superior model. You capture 100% of the consumer spending on your product. You know who is in your building, and then you can get to you know what I call the holy grail. You can get into the personalization stuff. You can give the actual members a fundamentally different experience than someone who is just coming there on a single new basis. Yeah. What about your visiting team allotment? Do you all touch that at all? We don't currently touch the visiting team allotment, but our vision at Fan Rally is that we, um, one, empower members to subscribe to their teams via our software, but we also run a centralized marketplace. So if you want to go and add on those two seats, you would do it from our centralized marketplace. The more and more teams we get to list seats on our marketplace, the more opportunity we have to create you know, more roll-up memberships. In other words, you can subscribe to every team in the Bay Area for an example. Um, so thinking about it through the lens of flexibility within a given market, um, because you have to you know, travel to be an away fan, it's not uh, what I would call low-hanging fruit for us. Uh, fan right. Product. That makes sense. I just think, so I, I went to Florida. I'm a Florida fan. I'm also partially a Texas A&M fan. I, I started going there and reporting when they were leaving the Big 12, and now I've been to at least one game a season there every year except for 2020. Um, so I think this will be my 12th year minus the – it will be 11 if you take out the 2020 year. And I'm going for the Florida game this year. I try not to go when my team is there, but just the way it worked out this year with my schedule that I have to go for the Florida game. Um, but, you know, I go to a game there every year, but I'm, I'm an A&M fan. I don't live anywhere near there. I would be in Florida system, but I know I'm going to go to a game at A&M every year. So I think as you have more schools online as a fan, it would be neat to be able to, you know, get into those systems for the other schools. Some people love to travel and they go to every away game. I, I don't have that kind of time, but I know other people do. Yeah, I think about the, the away um the away kind of opportunity through the lens of we'll probably end up selling uh, flexible voucher packs that can be used at any of our uh, yeah. partners down the road. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so talk to me a little bit. You gave a couple of examples already at South Carolina and at Stanford with how colleges are using this, and most of our listeners work in or around college athletic departments. Are there any other examples of ways you think schools are using Fan Rally in creative or innovative ways right now? Yeah, so I think I would start with uh, the most popular way, which I may or may not describe as innovative, uh, which is we actually take all of their existing flex programs. So if you're selling flexible vouchers, if you're selling uh, pick em plans, those sort of things, we can take those and automate them. So really just kind of that's our immediate value proposition to schools. Um, but what we enable are these new pass type models. And as you think about what that means from a donor perspective is your donations can actually come with a set of privileges. You may get access to every Olympic sport event on campus for a certain donation level. Um, we're actually running an exclusive club for the University of Pittsburgh in their basketball arena. So one of the things that we, you know, one of the things that we do with um, our college partners is we open up their ability to sell truly exclusive memberships. So you know, like that example that I gave you. Uh, Pitt uses that for their IC Life Baseline Club so that you can subscribe to that club, you can bring guests, you can upgrade into premium seats, all of those sort of things, and it's done on a membership subscription basis. Okay, that makes sense. Do you touch parking at all? We do not touch parking currently. It is on our roadmap. So we're, we're a seed-funded startup, so we've raised uh, just north of $4 million. Capital One is our biggest investor. Um, that is certainly something that we've got on the roadmap, but we don't do any parking. Currently. Yeah. That's good. You don't have to be everything to everyone at this point. I'm just curious. <laughs> okay. You, you mentioned earlier the fact that this is going to give athletic departments better access to that user level data. Can you tell us more about the data that you're, you're sort of funneling back to athletic departments at this point? Yeah, the easiest way to think about it is through the context of a travel reservation versus a ticket. And so the types of data, when we actually make a reservation, we are not only including the inventory data, but the user data for who's 
accessing that inventory. So everything comes as a reservation, who and what. And I think that's really the biggest powerful distinction is we're actually delivering to them who is using what products and having what experiences, who is taking advantage of what offers when we offer them an upgrade and we offer them the ability to add on food and beverage, all of those sort of things. So you're actually building profiles as opposed to just knowing who is the account owner of this scene. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And obviously, you know, data is king at this point. Everybody wants everything they can get their hands on. So they've got a better profile of those fans. Um, are there, do you foresee maybe in the future, and maybe there, maybe you have it now, but I'm, I'm thinking down the road, would there be opportunities for integration for things like merchandise and that sort of thing as well? 100%. We already have, I mean, our fundamental point of view is that, Membership should be a set of exclusive privileges, some of which is what price are you paying for concessions? When we did this in Oakland, we actually gave all of our members 50% off concessions. That was the most popular element of the membership. So these are some of the things that you can start to put together to make it feel the value of the membership goes much further than just the sum of the value of the tickets that they is there anything with the memberships that are specifically targeted at getting more students to games? So we actually run a few student programs and basically the way that it works is um, one of the methodologies that we use on our platform works like uh, the classic DVD version of Netflix. So you can have two games reserved at a time. You can have three games reserved at a time. So this is actually a good model for student ticket programs. So you want the ability to make sure that every student has equitable access to the available football seats. You might give everyone one uh, reservation slot that they can fill. And so each student is you know, deciding which one they want access to. If you have more availability, you can give them multiple. But we think about our software as really a powerful tool for making sure that um, when there's scarcity, you can provide equitable access because each person gets to choose which game they reserve, but you cap the number of games that they can hold. And so that yeah. leaves room for other uh, members to come in and reserve seats as well. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. A lot of folks we have on the podcast who work both in the pro sports space and in the college sports space are usually quick to tell me that pro sports are doing things better than college sports are. That, that's almost always the case, no matter what subject we're talking about. Um, is that true here? Are there things that pro teams are doing with Fan Rally that colleges aren't yet that maybe should be on their radar? 100%. And I would, I would go one step further, which is I think travel – does it way better than pro sports? Okay. Or does it better than college sports? So I'll give you an example. So we've partnered with the LA Clippers, and they've canceled all traditional season tickets in their upper bowl. They are using exclusively fan rally memberships in their upper bowl. They've, you know, we've got a bunch of cool aspects of the software where you can put, you know, in their example, the Lakers, the Warriors, and the Sixers require a premium reservation. In other words, they have to pay to reserve those seats. But all of the other 35 games are included in your $350 annual membership fee. Um, okay. We also run programs that are you know similar to a Costco-style membership. So we have a baseball team that we work with, charges 10 bucks a month for the ability to access $10 tickets on the day of the game only. So you can build these subscriptions on Fan Rally. It's completely customizable. And so our vision is we want to build a platform that inspires teams to be creative. Um, now we've got all of these abilities to build programs we never could in a traditional ticketing system because we had XYZ constraints or the tech for the you know primary ticketing partner wasn't quite up to snuff. And mm -hmm. we really enable a lot of this innovation and creativity that happens at the team level as opposed to anything that we're creating at fan rally. Can you do things like where you're essentially sending like a push notification on game day? Like I lived in Columbia, South Carolina, actually, since you said you work with South Carolina, I lived there for a year in between undergrad and law school. And when I was there, the baseball team was fantastic. I think they had won the college world series twice right before I got there and they had a great season the year I was there. So I actually went to far more baseball games than football games when I lived there. Football was not doing well when I lived there. <laughs> Um, and that was before I was a Florida fan. So I was on board to be a Gamecock fan, and then they were terrible, and I just couldn't do 
it. But baseball, baseball was great. So, but I was like a working professional. I wasn't a student. I didn't hold season tickets for anything. Um, but if I, if I had, and I'd had access to that app and I'd gotten like a push notification that day that I could go to the baseball game that night for 10 bucks, like I probably would have gone. So are, are people utilizing anything like that for last minute kind of inventory? Yeah, we have both paid and unpaid programs on that front. So one approach is, hey, it's $10 a month in order to get access to these offers. Another approach is there's a, you know, a freemium tier, right? So you may get access to take advantage of those 48 hours in advance for $10 a month, or you can sign up for the free tier, which is you basically just get a push notification on the day of the game. So you don't mm-hmm. get first access to inventory like the paid tier would, but then you get access to discounted seats. And the team doesn't have to worry about you reselling them because they're all done on Fan Rally direct reservations. So it's a really powerful uh, liquidation tool if you do have excess inventory as you get closer to the game. I love that. I'm from Atlanta, and my brother lived until recently walking distance to the Braves' new stadium. And, you know, a lot of times he would just walk over there and, you know, go up to the ticket window and buy last-minute tickets. And I know, uh, especially in baseball, there's several teams I've been aware of in the past that on game day like that will have you know, super cheap, t- you know, walk-up kind of tickets when they've got all that extra inventory. So that's what made me think of that. I just feel like there's so many, I can think of all these questions because I think there's so many possibilities for like where you go with this. And it, there are so many more possibilities than you would have with a paper ticket. Um, so I, I love the whole idea. The other thing that I thought of as we've been talking and sort of thinking through the ways athletic departments generate revenue and where the opportunities would be, are there opportunities for sponsor integration? Because I know sometimes you've got sponsor, if you've got physical tickets, you might have an ad for a sponsor somewhere on the ticket or a logo somewhere on there. So it, are there those kind of opportunities inside Fan Rally? Yeah, we, we actually incorporate sponsors in two different ways. So the first of which is we do allow teams to sell sponsorship within our entire application. And so that entire experience can be branded by a single partner. You can have multiple partners on there. Uh, But more importantly, we allow our teams to use Fan Rally to actually deliver sponsor seats. And so traditionally you give sponsors like a big block of seats. So you give them a big block of tickets in a traditional context. And those are great seats that have really low utilization rates. And yeah. the teams I worked at, you're talking 50, 60% of the time they get used. Otherwise, they're just sitting there. And so what we do is we say, don't give your sponsors a stack of static tickets. Give them the ability to make a set number of seat reservations throughout the season or to book up to 20 seats per game. And then you get a really efficient use of that seating inventory. The sponsors get more flexibility. So once again, this is another use case for why we believe direct reservations are a superior model. I love that. Yeah, especially, so as much as I write primarily about college football, I am a huge Major League Baseball fan. I'm so jealous that you had a job with the A's because my dream when I was at the WTA tour and was getting ready to graduate law school was to go work in baseball. Um, And the folks at the WTA were nice enough to introduce me to folks over at the then Devil Rays, uh, now Rays, to chat with them. And I actually met a young attorney who talked me out of it. He said, if you love baseball, you won't take this job. (laughs) And I, I didn't get it then. And I get it a little more now because you, if that's what you're doing all day, it's your job. It's not your hobby anymore. So I, I'm still just a baseball fan. I never really write about baseball. But one of the most infuriating things watching baseball is all the empty seats behind home plate. All of these people who've bought these very expensive season tickets or have bought corporate tickets, and they're just sitting there empty. My law firm did that when I worked at a big firm in Atlanta. And I took those seats every chance I got because they would just let them sit empty. And they had these great seats seats that were between home plate and the dugout, like second row back. I mean, you couldn't have been any closer. And most nights they sat empty. Such a shame. (laughs) This is why, so the last thing I'll share with you relative to kind of the the difference between what we do and what teams experience when they sell traditional seats is we can actually drastically improve teams yield from a revenue perspective on those premium seats. So that is the classic use case. You sell your most premium seat locations, one, in exclusively full season strips. So you got to buy all 81 in order to get access to them. Uh, and two, you're selling them to the wealthiest, busiest, you know, tranche of consumers that you have. And so 
Your best seats, the biggest value, you have the lowest utilization rate. They're sitting there empty right behind home plate. Uh, when you move to a direct reservation model, we found that subscribers are willing to pay somewhere between 40 and 60% of a full season ticket price for the non-transferable ability to go to any game they want to go to. Mm -hmm. And the utilization of those privileges ends up being in the 30, 35% range. And so teams actually generate a lot more revenue selling access to their seats than they do selling them in traditional ticketed fashion. And then you have full seats behind home plate. That makes sense. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you think is a big advantage to this model versus traditional traditional ticketing? I think it is really, you know, I'm going to go back to kind of the, the core theme, which is differentiate your member experience from those that just attend your games on a single game basis. I think as we think about, you know, your point around resale, it's really mm -hmm. about beginning to think about your role as an athletic director, as, you know, a head of revenue for a team, as much more about creating lifetime value. How are you actually developing relationships with your most important fan that continue throughout their entire life? And I think mm -hmm. one of the things that we've seen is when you sell them a stack of resellable tickets that are each readily available in some sort of comparable form on the secondary market, you get this common mindset, which is grandpa used to hold these tickets because these were our seats. And now that value prop is not resonating with 35 yeah. year olds anymore. They don't want the same seats. And so we have to think of more compelling ways to deliver member value and giving them access to your manifest, moving my seats here from there, first access to things, the ability to reserve the seats behind home plate for a single inning, get your Instagrammable moment, and then file out like you would on Southwest Airlines and bring in the next group. These are the type of things that I think really move the needle for the modern consumer. They want to walk around and do all of these things, yeah. but they also want access to those really cool moments, and they don't need them for the entire three-hour block. That's a great point. I, I grew up in Atlanta and I'm a big Braves fan, but I'm also a Red Sox fan. And I would love to sit on the Green Monster for like one inning. I don't think I'd love sitting out there a whole game, mm -hmm. yeah. but I want to say I've done it. I want, I've, I've stood up there, so I know what the view is, but I'd love to have one inning up there and that'd be plenty for me. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I appreciate you coming and teaching us a little bit more about Fan Rally. I, I'm sold on this idea. I, I can't, I have nothing I can do with it, but I can tell my audience that this as a fan sounds like a great idea to me. And I so appreciate you coming and sharing with us. I will make sure that your website is in the show notes uh, and your social media channels and I, I, anywhere else you want people to follow you or make sure they check out. Uh, no, just the website. I mean, we're, we're constantly on the road during different conferences. You know, we like to engage directly with the teams and really start by listening. What are you trying to achieve? What are your long-term objectives? And that's the beauty of Fan Rally is the platform is completely customizable. We can build something for an NBA team and something completely different for a college athletic program all on the same software stuff. Well, thank you so much for joining the podcast and teaching us more about this. I, I can't wait for a team that I'm involved with to have this so I can try it out for myself. So thanks for coming and sharing more with us. Thank you very much for having me, Christy. Appreciate it. Thank you again to Chris Giles for joining the Business of College Sports podcast. I'm so intrigued by everything that Fan Rally can do, both for fans and for athletic departments. If you haven't heard about Fan Rally before, I hope this encourages you to check it out because I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Thank you for being here and for listening to or watching the Business of College Sports podcast. If you have time, I would love for you to rate and review us on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. That helps us reach a bigger audience, get better guests. Not that all of our guests aren't fabulous, but it helps us get new guests who maybe haven't heard of the podcast before. I'm so appreciative for each and every one of you. And if you have an idea for a future episode, you can reach me at Christy at Christy Dosh com or DM me. You can follow me on all the social media networks at sportsbizmiss. 
Thank you, and I hope you have a fabulous rest of your day or week wherever you are.